Hey folks, it's been a while, hasn't it? After 22 years of nightmare and terror, saved only by a desperate conviction of the mythical source of certain impressions, I am unwilling to vouch for the truth of that which I think I found in Western Australia on the night of July 17th to 18th, 1935. There is a reason to hope that my experience was wholly or partly a hallucination, for which, indeed, abundant cases existed. And yet, its realism was so hideous that sometime, that I sometimes find hope impossible. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final episode, kind of, we'll, we'll get to that. But for right now, the final review of The Car Quest of H.P. Lovecraft. And today, we will be checking out the shadow out of time. We made it, folks. We finally reached it. We have reached the end of this epi of this book, of this collection. And while there were certainly stumbles, especially during the sporadic reading of this last story over the last couple of days, I think this is quite a fitting conclusion to the first stage of our car quest. Now, how was the story? Well, let's get into it, shall we? So, the story follows a man named Nathaniel Wingate Peasley as he tries to sort... He's a uh, political economy professor in Miskatonic University. And while he's teaching one day, he is stricken by a case of amnesia that knocks him out for a good chunk of time from like 1908 to 1913. And from that point on, he investigates what it was that had possessed him in a, in a certain way. And he finds out that it, the origins of such possession may be more extraterrestrial than he realized. So, how was the final story of our collection? It was actually really good. <laughs> I think we end on a very good, grim note with this story. Um, I think th there's quite a lot to go over, actually, weirdly. Um, so, if, if you see me look over here, uh, I just wrote some notes. So, uh... This story mostly introduces the idea of the great race of Yith. And uh, so the great race of Yith is some sort of extraterrestrial species that has somehow conquered the ways of time, that has conquered the space-time continuum in its entirety and is able to somewhat, like, mind transfer... Uh, their consciousness into different periods of time. So they're able to sort of, again, they're, so how it works from what I understand, and there are going to be spoilers in this, um, as probably noted in the opening. So they mind transfer. So like they, sh they shoot off uh, their consciousness into a body that is not theirs, and then their mind of the person who they just uh, transferred with goes back. And uh, this is to sort of learn about histories and all sorts of things, having conquered time. And uh, something I noticed about the story that seems quite different from Lovecraft stories typically, Lovecraft stories, when, they, when he does describe stuff, it's still in a way that is... It's describing it, but it's also very vague about it. So it's like, 
he'll describe what something looks like, but he'll just describe the basics of it. He won't go into too much detail. Here he gets in, he does it similarly here, but it's a lot more descriptive uh, than what I was used used to, especially compared to Shadow Over Innsmouth, where it was just um, just exposition dump after exposition dump on the town and the fish people and everything, and it was just here it was more organically put into the story uh, compared to again Shadow Over Innsmouth, where the story would just just cut to a halt, just just go to a screeching halt just so Lovecraft could go on about the mythos of this place. Um, which I understand and does contribute to a benefit of Shadow of Rinsmith, where it was setting up a creepy atmosphere, but I feel like in terms of actual storytelling, it does kind of bring the story to a screeching halt, just so he could explain it. Here it feels a lot more natural, and even in like the middle, where it's like kind of describing the lifestyle of the great ri race of Yith, and how they operate, and how their world is, and all this stuff. Which, by the way, I'm not sure if a lot of Lovecraft's understanding of geology, and geography, and science, and, and all that kind of, st and history, uh, really works nowadays. Um, but uh, I think it actually helped a lot. Uh, something I al that also kind of halted me from reading the story, and why I read it so sporadically, yeah, I think this was because I was not in the right mindset of, I think I was like, I have to read it for the series, I have to read it for the series. But I think once my mind kind of, I let that part of it go, and I really just kind of let myself enjoy the story, even though there was some possibly racist language in it, um, there, which is, that was still kind of like, ugh. but, um, but like when it was just, when I just kind of let the story play out, and I wasn't just like, gotta do it for the series, gotta do it for the series, gotta do it for the series. I quite enjoyed it. Again, racist language aside. Although, again, that is definitely something to address that there is possibly... Yeah. That's another thing. I may have mentioned it in a, in a previous episode. I am more like, um... I'm more accustomed to when he just straight up uses, like, slurs and stories, which I'm not sure he does here. I, I think he does. But then again, that sort of, that, it, it's the difference between, like, earlier stories when he would just drop those words compared to other stories where it's more kind of, like, subtle-ish. So I'm not quite sure if, like, the subtle stuff I didn't catch or stuff. I'm not sure if. What I'm basically saying is I'm not sure if the subtle stuff went over my head or not. Um, but I knew that something was probably up. Um, but otherwise, um, just like little uh, bits, uh, uh, there were uh, in terms of the Lovecraft mythos, uh, I feel like having read this whole collection now, a lot of the like ties and stuff kind of consolidate and so now I'm just kind of like oh this happened and this happened and this happened and so I'm kind of getting a larger scope of the universe which is cool um there was kind of a funny th little moment where I was reading a passage and it was describing how the great race of Yith sort of process time how they process it you know all of the past all of the present and all of the future all at once and I was like trial famidorians but as the story went on, I was like, no, these these aren't Tralfamadorians. At the most, they're probably Lovecraftian versions of Tralfamadorians, but from Sla from Slaughterhouse-Five. But uh, anyway, for those who didn't catch the reference, um, a name came up, uh, well, as well as the references to Miskatonic University and Arkham and Nyarlathotep. Nyarlathotep was referenced once. Um, a name came up. William Dyer, and specifically his involvement in a certain Antarctic expedition. So, which, that will become very, very, very important as we move on to the later volumes, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, wait, they were up there. 
Um, but uh, th that whole thing about Dyer and the expedition to Antarctica, which is referenced, I think, like about like twice, maybe three times in this story. Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll definitely be going there in uh, on our car quest. Um, so, yeah, once more, the shadow out of time. I really dug it. I really thought that it was good and... And creepy as Lovecraft typically is, uh, the escalation and the tone and the atmosphere is all just a, you know good A plus. Um, for my final ranking of these stories, uh, of this story specifically, um, I would probably give this an A. Shadow out of time, I would probably give it an A. Um, it did take me a while to get through, but I feel like in the end it was ultimately worth it. So, now that the first book is done, under my belt, where do we go now? Well, I know one thing's for sure. I'm taking a break after this. Um, after the next episode, which I'll get into also in a second. I am taking a break after this. There's only so much of one author you can read at once. But that's okay, because a little bit of self-promotion here. I am starting a channel, I, I kind of set it up over the course of like last month or so. Uh, it's called The Library Car, and you can find it in the description and on my YouTube uh, channel, like the top with the, with the image of like the universe, the cosmos, there's like a little link that says Library Car, you should find it there, um, where I'll be doing book reviews, like not just short story reviews, but like full on like books. Uh, I have a couple ideas of where to start, uh, a couple books over here I might be interested in, one right here that I'm in the process of reading, um, so I'm not quite sure about that, but uh, if you want to see me over at the library car, that'd be great, um, but uh, yeah, uh, so even though this is the last review, uh, this is not the last episode of, the se of this season anyway. Um, th I'm going to be going through sort of a, a mini retrospective slash tier list ranking of the stories that we've read so far. So, although there's still that, and that might come out tomorrow, um, keyword might, uh, given how long this episode took to get, to get made, um... Yeah, it's been fun going through this series. It's been fun going through this collection uh, with the ups and the downs. And I'll be taking a break for sure, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of miss this, actually, now that it's actually come to a conclusion. Uh, again, for now. So until the next episode and until the next stage of our car quest of H.P. Lovecraft continues, I have been your host, Andrew Carl LC. This has been the car quest of H.P. Lovecraft. And I will see you all next episode with a retrospective and ultimate ranking of the stories thus far on our car quest of H.P. Lovecraft. So until then, see you later.